live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bible study tonight. God bless you all for, for tuning in. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the word fear. Now, there are two kinds of fear, which you know. Two kinds, good fear and bad fear. <laughs> the good fear is the fear of the Lord. And that is so good because it does so much. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It, it just, uh, it buoys you up. And so that you don't have to be afraid of anything with God on your side, or you on God's side, rather. And so, but that's not the fear we're going to be speaking about tonight. We're going to be talking about the other type. The fear that people have in this world. There are seven main types of fear, and we'll talk about those in sequence. So the first one I'd like to mention is <clears throat> the, uh, the fear of man, the fear of man. So before we go too much further, let's turn over to the Bible, to 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <coughs> so God did not place within us the spirit of fear of anyone, the negative side, the negative fear. God didn't put that in us at all. And so... Let's take a look at these foundational uh, scriptures here. How to fight the fears which come upon us. You use the word of God because the enemy, Satan, has no defense against the word of God. This is our spiritual warfare weapon, main weapon. Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Another main weapon is the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus. That's right. But we must be courageous because the word of God is powerful. All right. All right, yeah. Okay. The first fear, then, is the fear of man. Over in Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare. But whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare. But you put your trust in the Lord and you'll be safe. A snare can lead you. It's just like you're in a trap. In fact, you might replace the word snare with trap. There are many kinds of traps for you. And the fear of man brings those into your life. You want to avoid that. How do you fight it? Hebrews 13, verse 6. Let's have a look at that. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. <coughs> Excuse me. Hebrews 13. Last chapter of Hebrews. It says, <clears throat> in fact, let, let's take verse uh, 5 also. Let your banner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's the fear of man. So if the Lord is your helper, we should never fear what man can do to us. And so that's a big snare. I mean, the fear of man. And, and that manifests not only in an uncivilized society, but a civilized society. Because you fear how you appear to others. Will I be appear good to them, hireable, or will I appear to be a fool? How do I look in their eyes? 
What if I say this? What if I do that? That's fear of man. And so that always brings a snare. Let's look at the next type of fear. The fear of war. It's a powerful fear. Fear of war. We fight this with Psalm 27, verses 3 and 5. We'll read 3, 4, and 5. Psalm 27. <clears throat> Aren't you glad that God has provided us with ammunition against these fears? Amen. Praise the Lord. And pass the ammunition. That was a phrase which we had during World War II. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> and and, and uh, over in Ephesians, I believe, it, it says, Bring up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I like to add, and the ammunition of the Lord, the <laughs> Word of God. <laughs> Okay, Psalm 27. Let's look at verse 3, 4, and 5. Verse 3 is a strong one. It says, Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, this doesn't necessarily pertain to church, although that too, but it pertains to worshiping God in his temple in heaven all the days of your life. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, Shall he hide me? <coughs> he shall set me up upon a rock. Now, what is the secret place of God? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's look at Psalm 31. <clears throat> I'm fighting a cough, as you can hear, but I'm winning. Amen. Psalm 31, verse 20. It says... <coughs> <clears throat> thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence. <clears throat> From the pride of man, hide them in the secret of thy presence. From the pride of man. So, being hidden means that you are in the manifest presence of God. That manifest presence hides people from evil. It takes care of you. So you don't have to fear. It makes you, as it were, invisible to man. <coughs> Third type of fear. Oh, I, I forgot. Let's turn over to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. There's a good verse in there. Psalm 91, verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, <coughs> Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night. That's crime nor for the arrow that flies by day. That's war, the arrow that flies by day. Let me read onward, verse 6. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, and that is disease. Nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday, and that is accident. Excuse me a moment. So you don't need to fear the arrow that flies by day. That pertains to war. And not just arrows. Bullets. Bombs. Evil. Hand grenades. Don't have to fear those. There's a story, a true story, that during the <coughs> First World War, when the British Army, fighting 
against the Germans, there was a brigadier who forced all of his soldiers under him to read Psalm 91 every day. Read it every day. And at the end of the fighting, and they were in some severe battles, not a single soldier was killed. Some were wounded, but they were not. No one died. They claim Psalm 91. Hallelujah. It's a true story. Let's go on. The third fear is fear of disease. Yeah, that's right. Fear of COVID. I, I might just place that in there foremost because that's what everybody is speaking about now. That's what you get on all the TV channels. COVID, COVID, COVID. I'm so tired of it. I'd rather watch anything except explanations of, of COVID and the varieties of it. Yeah, right. There's the first variety, uh, Delta, and then came Lambda, and then came Omicron, and I wonder what they do when they run out of Greek letters. <laughs> We're still protected, no matter what they have, even at the end, even if they find an Omega version, still. We're under the secret place of the Most High, which is the presence of God. All right, so disease, we can look at 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Now, a lot of you know that by heart. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. I want to read it. It's talking about Jesus here, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Did you catch that? The tense is past tense. You were healed. Not you're going to be. You were healed. That's God speaking. Therefore, we should accept what he said. You know, you may feel like you still have a, have a problem. You might still have the pain. God said, you are healed. You were. You were healed at the cross. Jesus paid the penalty. The stripes on his back paid the penalty for you, for your healing. Now, you have to claim that for your healing. You have to exercise your faith. For that. Praise the Lord. All right, that's not the only scripture. Psalm 91. I think I just read that, that area. Let's go back there a moment. Psalm 91. Once again, let's home in on just a moment here. Let's home in on verse 6. It's, it's uh, that we should not fear, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness. Don't fear the pestilence that walks in darkness. Don't invite it into your home by saying, well, the flu is coming around again, and we'll probably catch it because a lot of folks come into our house and they bring the flu germs. Don't ever say that. You are inviting the pestilence into your house. You say, my house is protected by the presence of God. It's here, and no flu will hit me in the name of Jesus. You exercise that, the power that you have. Remember, folks, we are a new creation in Christ. We're the second creation, the spiritual creation. Jesus is the first member of it. The first one raised from the dead into the new creation. But we follow him as equal members in the new creation. We are created with a new spirit, like God. You might call us little gods, small g. Jesus is the great God. We're little, but we are, in fact, the Psalms calls us gods little g. We'll never be Jesus, but we're anointed with his anointing, filled with his spirit, even as he is. 
Hallelujah. So we can do what God asks us to do in his word. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Okay, let's go on. Look at Philippians 2, verse 10. Philippians 2, verse 10 in the New Testament. Okay. This is a weapon that you can use against disease. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, every knee shall bow of things on the earth. And so, things on the earth have names like COVID-19, like, like Omicron, like flu. Those are names, specific kinds of diseases. Every one has a name lower than the name of Jesus and must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And when we speak the name of Jesus with faith, they bow their knee. That's right. Praise the Lord. One more scripture there. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Matthew 10. Verse 8, <clears throat> Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out, he addressed them. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now that pertains to to us as disciples also. If we are disciples of Jesus, we can do the same thing. Heal the sick. If we have power to heal the sick, why fear disease? Let's exercise our power. Let's exercise the word of God. Let us boldly do what the Bible gives us permission to do, not just permission, commandment. We must exercise faith. Okay, now the fourth fear is the fear of death, fear of dying. We fight <coughs> that one, excuse me, with Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to have another little drink. Hebrews chapter 2, Verses 14 and 15. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, we are the children, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might render powerless, my Bible says destroy, Satan's not destroyed, but his works are. Might render powerless him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So folks, if you fear death, you're in bondage. You may not realize it, but it's the fact. It's the truth, what the Bible says. Sometimes facts don't agree with the truth. And it's hard sometimes to accept the truth. But if you fear death, you are in bondage. And so, if you look at Psalm 91, verse 16, there's a solution there. Psalm 91, verse 16. <coughs> That's why that psalm is so powerful. It comes against many fears. Here we go. Psalm 91, verse 16. And God is speaking. He says, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let me start with verse 14. Set the, the stage here. I, I 
kind of reluctant to just use one verse. Verse 14, because he hath set his love upon me, God says, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. That's so powerful. So powerful. So you say to me, yeah, but how do you know I'm going to live a long life? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you in the family of God? If you are, this is your promise. This is your promise. But you have to take that promise and make it yours by faith. That's right. If you look at the Word of God, it says in Genesis 6, verse 3. Ah, yes, I love to quote that. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. These are the days, this is in the days of Adam. Genesis 6. But it shows God's will. Genesis 6, verse 3, God speaking. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be at hundred and twenty years. What? A hundred and twenty? You may be shocked at that. Nobody lives that, that long in our day. Oh, yes, they do. You just don't know it. There are five areas on the earth today, mostly located in the mountains, where people live a hundred and twenty to a hundred and thirty or more years. Because they have minerals, they're fed by minerals from the glacier melt. And their crops planted there are full of minerals from the earth. They have long life, they have no stress, and they live 120 plus years. You say, well, we can't claim that today. We, we aren't in the mountains, but we have little tablets which we take, which are minerals. Our bodies need that when we get older. And so we take our minerals every day, and I've claimed that scripture for 120 years. I'm a young, young 87. I got another 33 years to go. That's right. <laughs> if I desire, if I want to. God does not take your life. He knows the days of your life because he knows the future. But he doesn't cause it to happen. That's right. Knowing something and causing it to occur are two different things. So, trust in the Lord. See how long you want to live. Believe God. 80, 90, 100, and 120 is not the limit. It's my limit. I've chosen that. <laughs> Unless the Lord comes back first. Okay. Let's look at the fifth fear. The fifth one is crime. Let's, I, I think we just read that in Psalm 91. Look at verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. That's crime. Because criminals strike in the dark at night. They break into houses, they steal, they kill, they destroy. That's crime. So we don't need to fear that crime. Proverbs 3, verse 24, validates that. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 24. When you lie down, you shall not be afraid, yea, you shall lie down, and your sleep shall be sweet. That's a promise of God. You shall lie down, and your sleep shall be sweet. You don't have to worry about crime. Remember, God has an angel army. 
and some of them are stationed around your house. You may see them occasionally or hear them. They're God's army. They're protecting you. You can rejoice in that. They are assigned to you. That's right. You are important to God. Very important. You have a specific task to accomplish here on this earth. You're not here by accident. You're here by, by divine design. And so God is protecting you until you accomplish your purpose. You better find out what that is and start accomplishing it. Start doing it. You don't want to appear before God and have him ask you, I didn't call you. Why are you here? Oh, Lord, I'm so tired of life. No, we don't have that option. We want to, him to say, welcome home, son or daughter. Welcome. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two more. Number six, <clears throat> the fear of nature. You say, wow, what's that? A fear of hurricanes, floods, the fear of earthquakes, the fear of animals, that kind of thing. That's a broad fear. You don't need to be afraid of that because God has given you power over nature. That's right. Let's look at Luke 8. Luke 8, verses four and five, uh, 24 and 25. Luke 8, verses 24 and 25. Now, this is Jesus acting as a son of God, a son like you can be a son of God or daughter of God doesn't pertain to sex. It pertains to God's child. Now, this is what Jesus did by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by his power as the Son of God. He gave that up when he came to earth, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 8, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> uh, let's start with verse uh, 22. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a boat with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. Now that was his intention. And they launched forth. Verse 23. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they that were filled with water and were in jeopardy, meaning sinking. And they came to him and awoke him and said, Master, Master, it, <clears throat> we perish. How's that for a non-faith statement? We're going to die, Jesus. Don't you care? Then he spoke. And, uh, he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Then verse 25 is the one that gets me every time. And he said unto them, where is your faith? You might put an accent on the your. Where is your faith? In other words, they could have done that. They could have rebuked the wind and the waves, and it would have stopped for them as well. They were fearful. Fear is the opposite of faith, but they could have done it. You don't have to fear animals. I've got a dog story that's many years old, and I won't tell the whole thing, just the end of it. The Lord rebuked me because I feared these two dogs. They came after me, big German shepherd dogs, baring their teeth got in the car and left. He rebuked me and said, I thought I gave you power over animals. I said, you did. He said, well, in other words, go back. So I stopped the car, turned it around, went back, opened the door. There they came again. And I yelled at him and pointed at him, get away from me in the name of Jesus. And the one dog ran 
as fast as he could away from me. The other dog got down on his haunches and licked his paws. And I walked right past him to the door of the house that I was sent to. So you've got to not fear those animals, even though they could tear you apart. Of course, you use wisdom. Never foolish. Like the man a few days ago in South Africa's game park, he got out of the car and went too far away and an elephant stomped on him and killed him. You got to be wise. That's right. There's one more fear. The fear of the devil. Many people fear him as if he's equal with God. I hate that, even a comparison of Satan to Jesus. There's no comparison. Jesus created the devil when he was an angel, a good angel, a worship angel, and he fell because of his pride. There's no comparison. The one is not in the same category as the other. Jesus is, has all power. The devil has some power. Jesus gave you his power by faith. So we fight this fear with Luke chapter 10, 19, verse 19. Luke 10, verse 19. It's just a couple pages away from where we were. Let's start with verse 17. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. Mm -hmm. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now I want to explain to you, in the Greek language, it's, Behold, I give unto you authority, exousia, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis, the dynamite of the enemy. All the dunamis, the, the actual power of the enemy. You have authority over it all. But you have to use it. It's there. But if you fear... It does you no good. You have to lay hold on that promise. Bring it from the book into your heart, in, out of your mouth. That's faith. Faith is not in this book called the Bible. The faith is in you taking the word of God and speaking it out of your mouth in every situation. It will change your life and the lives of those around you. One more, James 4, verse 7. Let's look that up. James chapter 4, verse 7. <clears throat> Here we are. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It doesn't say he'll tear you apart. He'll set up things against you that will destroy you. It doesn't say that. It says, resist the devil and he'll run away from you. He will flee from you. You don't have to fear the devil. He's a created angel. He's the works of God's hands. And over in Psalm 8... It says man has been given authority over the works of God's hands. That should cement it in your mind and heart. And over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that we're going to judge angels. God never has a lesser creature judge a greater. But the greater always judges the lesser. That shows you our position regarding angels. God created man higher than the angels. God created us for a house for himself to inhabit and to be like him. How much are you like him? 
Let the Holy Spirit make you like him. Submit to him. And you will become like him. So don't fear those seven fears. They're under your feet. Thank you. Hallelujah. We can trust our God. He's righteous. He's joyful. It says in Psalm 16, in the presence of God, there is joy forevermore. If you're in his presence, you should manifest that joy. Right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is so good, so powerful. Help us to memorize the verses and to use them, to store them up in our heart and in our mind. And when necessary, to speak them out of our mouth with faith and to create the situation that we desire, whether it's safety from one thing or another, that we know there is no need to fear. There is need to trust in you. Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Right? Amen. Okay, God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Good work. Hallelujah.